All right, we're ready for you back here on stream one. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Robin Crowley, who is a rangeland scientist with the Northern Territory Government. She researches fire and grazing in Australian savannas. She currently leads the Sweet Spot Project across Northern Australia, which aims to find the sweet spot of pasture utilisation and optimise breeder herd productivity in Northern Australia. She also runs the long-term fire experiment at Kidman Springs, which she is going to talk about today. Please make her feel as welcome as you can via remote uh, video camera, Dr. Robin Cowley. G'day everyone. Um, today I'm going to be uh, thinking about what we found from our long-term fire experiment at Kidman Springs. And I'm going to question some of the assumptions, I guess, that have underlined why we've been doing this fire experiment for 29 years. So in particular in relation to managing the landscape and managing our woody cover in the landscape. So why do we burn? We know that savannas have evolved with fire um, even before human settlement of the continent, uh, savannas would have burnt every year extensively, starting with dry lightning in the late dry season. And those fires would have been hot and they would have burnt until they came across a creek or another burnt patch. Um, so the landscape and the plants in it are well adapted to fire. And they're very resilient under fire and difficult to actually kill with fire. The other reason we might want to burn is because we have observed woody thickening both globally and across Northern Australia uh, on some of our savannah landscapes. And I'll talk more about that. And of course, none of this matters if trees don't compete with the grass layer, but there's been a lot of science that suggests that it does. And so when you're trying to grow cattle, you wanna make sure that you've got a productive pasture. So you don't want your grassland to turn into a woodland. So today I'm going to question all of these underlying assumptions, looking at the data uh, not only in our fire experiment, but what the eye in the sky, the satellites have been telling us since 1988. So is the grey savanna thickening? Um, this graph here on the left, on the y-axis, shows persistent green cover that was mentioned in a talk yesterday. Um, that's basically the woody signal coming out of the satellite. So it's an index of woody cover. And on the bottom axis, we've got um, how woody covers changed from 1988 to 2018. Now, from the Sweet Spot project, I've been collating satellite cover data sets and at 92 sites across Northern Australia. So this is where we've had breeder herd data sets we've been monitoring. And I'm going to be modeling them. And I thought, you know what? I can look at how woody covers changed at all these sites. And I have enough sites per region to actually average that between the regions and get a bit of a look at what's been happening. So it's not all of the region, it's just some indicative properties, some sites from there. It's usually in the more productive landscapes. So it's not in the spin effects, it'll be in the good red soils and the black, black soils. What we found was that um, some regions, it really is increasing quite a lot. So the Catherine Sturt Plateau, um, the woody cover doubled in that time. Whereas the couple of sites in North Queensland that we had, um, woody cover fluctuated a lot, but it ended up around about the same as where it started. Um, other regions, VRD kind of doubled during that time, but started at a lower level. The Alice region looks like it's ended at a high note, but we know that since then there's been drought and it's probably right back where it started. Um, so why has the, um, what we see here is persistent green is the green line through time. On the right, we've got um, Kidman Springs. On the left, we've got um, those sites in North Queensland. And on the, the black line that's going up and down is an index of drought. And so you can see in North Queensland, when the black line was below the horizontal axis, that's when they're in extended periods of drought. And there was quite a few. And the green line, which is the woody cover, tended to go down during dry periods and increase again during wet periods. Whereas at Kidman Springs in Northwestern Australia, where they've had increased rainfall, um, there weren't extended periods of drought and woody cover just kept increasing until about 2005 where it stayed pretty high. So we think the difference between these regions is whether or not there's extended drought periods. So we've got more information about um, how season and fire has influenced woody cover change from our long-term fire experiment at Kidman Springs, 400 k south of Darwin, 680 mil rain um, on a grassland and a woodland. 
So the grasslands, ribbon blue grass, rosewood bohemia trees, and the black spear grass is on the woodland with inland bloodwood and silver box. You can see um, images there from the ground and the air. Our fire experiment looked at the impact of burning early in the dry season um, in June for cool fires and late in the dry season in October for hot fires. And then we had treatments that burned every two years or four years or six years versus unburnt controls. Now, during our fire experiment, um, the top graph here shows rainfall during that time. And you can see that right up until 2018, there was only three years with below median rainfall. So that's why persistent green, the woody cover was increasing so much during that time. But you can see since then in 2019 and 2018, we've had two dry years in a row. And so our ground data shows us what's happened with woody cover since then. So this graph, these graphs show canopy cover, which is the amount of the top of the tree canopy that's covering the soil, similar to the persistent green index. We've got the grassland and the woodland on separate graphs and change through time. Now, this is a combination of ground collected canopy cover and also canopy cover extracted from hanging out of a chopper, taking photos of the ground. Um, so we've got here the different fire treatments, which are condensed down into unburnt, early burnt or late burnt, all of the different timing treatments are averaged there. On the grassland, you can see that it didn't matter when you burnt, um, there was less increase through time when there was fire. On the woodland, you really didn't get much of an impact of fire unless you burnt late in the dry season. But what's particularly interesting here is what happened after those two dry years in a row. So in 2021, when we went out this year, we found that on the grassland, if it wasn't burnt, the woody cover was unchanged, still going strong. Whereas on the woodland, all treatments burnt and unburnt dramatically dropped by about half. So they declined to very low levels, sometimes similar to when we first started measuring these sites. On the grassland, the burnt um, sites did reduce a little bit with two dry years, but not as much as um, on the woodland. And it wasn't just the canopy cover. This is the tree basal area. We only have been collecting it since 2009. But similarly, you can see that the changes in the woodland um, after those two dry years were quite dramatic, but not so much on the grassland. So our first question was the savannah thickening? Yes, yes, it has been, but not everywhere. It depends on whether or not there's been multi-year dry periods, which can undo the increases during wetter years. Um, and we know from our fire experiment that applying fire on the landscape can dampen those increases, but it can't completely stop or prevent these um, woody, woody trees from making the most of woody years. Interestingly, on the grassland, our most productive landscapes, um, woody cover wasn't as affected by drought as on the woodland. So none of this matters, I guess, if trees aren't competing with grass. If there's more trees, it doesn't matter as long as they're not competing with the grass layer. So we decided to look at, well, what does the data tell us from our fire experiment? The first time we collected this data was 2009. And I quickly, excitedly got home from the field and said, right, I'm going to look for these tree grass specks. Looked at yield collected at the site versus tree basal areas at the site. And there wasn't really much of a pattern. There wasn't a strong relationship. And I thought, well, that can't be right. And I uh, thought, well, I'll just, maybe it was a wet year and there wasn't much competition. I'll measure it some other years. So we've been measuring quite a few years now. And um, what we found is that on the grassland, in some years, there was um, patterns in yield consistent with competition. So that is, there was less yield where there was more trees. But on the woodland, not so much. Um, sometimes the trend was even more grass with more trees, although they were never significant. On these graphs, the solid lines indicate significant correlations. Uh, and again, when we look with canopy cover, um, similar pattern on the grassland, there was often um, negative correlations between pasture yield and canopy cover, but on the woodland um, only once in 2021. So why is it that there might not be competition between the tree grass layers so much in the woodland. We don't really know, but some possibilities include <clears throat> it's over a limestone layer, trees might be accessing water below that, trees may be just accessing nutrients and water at a different layer compared to the pasture layer. 
Um, and this is a low fertility site compared to the grasslands. So it's quite possible that um, the, the leaf litter coming from the trees is actually um, providing um, nutrients for the pasture layer. And that might actually explain why in 2021 there did appear to be competition because it had been after two very dry years, in which case there might have been a buildup of soil fertility during that time. So nutrients weren't limiting and then um, they were competing for water or some other thing. So are the trees competing with the grasses? Maybe not always. Um, certainly did appear to be the case for the grassland, our most productive part of the landscape but not usually for the woodland, at least not what I could detect. So in summary, do we need to burn these bushes? To burn or not to burn? Maybe not. Maybe not where there's poor condition pastures. So we wouldn't recommend burning annual pastures um, because sometimes that's really bad for the um, recovery. They, they don't recover well if you don't have perennial grasses in the system. Where you've got multi-year droughts that are managing your woody cover, you might not need to burn. Um, and if trees aren't competing with the pasture layer, then there may not be any need to worry about increasing woody cover either. But then on the other hand, if you've got productive grasslands where there appears to be encroachment of woody cover and that woody cover is causing a decline in pasture growth, then it might be a really good idea to be burning those grasslands to keep them productive. And that's probably where you'll get the greatest return for implementing fire. Thanks to my co-authors, Rod Dyer, who started the project in 93. Mark Herndon did the stats, Karen Joyce analyzed the um, aerial imagery and our photographers. Is it in frame?